What a beautiful day out here in the Swiss Alps. The sky is almost perfectly blue. It's gonna clear up by tonight. The air is crisp and it's one of those days that just calls for stargazing. And as it is almost written in the law of astrophotography, when the sky is this clear, which is supposed to be for the next five days, obviously it is full moon week. Looking at the forecast, which is promising a four or five clear nights in a row, Obviously, it is suboptimal in terms of the conditions with the full moon, but it is too good to waste. So instead of packing everything away, I'm going to find a way to make something decent out of it. So in today's video, I'll show you how I will go ahead and pick a target to image under the full moon, take you through the actual imaging process, and later we'll process the final image on the computer. But let's get right into it. My name is Lucen, you're watching The Space Koala. When it is full moon time, astrophotographers have a few options. Option one, stay home and process all the data that you capture during the new moon. Honestly, this is the most productive and sensible way to spend your time. Option two, choose a target that isn't completely ruined by moonlight. You can photograph um, the moon itself, the planets, maybe do some solar imaging during the day, or go for some super bright like globular or open clusters where the stars punch right through the moon glow. But I decided to do neither one of those. Recently, I got my hands on a set of ultra narrow band filters from Antlia, 2.5 nanometers each. The plan is to pick a bright emission nebula. Narrow band filters block almost everything except the specific wavelengths transmitted by ionized gases, which makes them great for cutting through the moonlight. Reflection nebulas, on the other hand, are a completely different story. They don't emit their own light. They simply reflect the light of nearby stars, which is broadband and covers the whole visible spectrum. That means a narrow band filter won't capture much of them at all. And under a full moon, the extra sky brightness completely washes them out. So they're basically invisible when the moon is up. It is November, which complicates things. The summer targets are already low in the west, and since I have a very high western horizon, I can't really go for them anymore. The winter constellations around Orion are still a bit too low for the start of the night. But that leaves us with the region around Cassiopeia and Cepheus, which both happen to be full of beautiful nebulosity. I recently photographed a close-up of the Heart Nebula while testing the Sesto Senso 3 focuser on the C8 SAT telescope. So today we're just going to move right next door from the Heart Nebula to its neighbor, the Sol Nebula, also known as the Embryo Nebula. Now these names are always a bit funny. The heart nebula is actually heart-shaped, so that kind of makes sense, but the soul is likely just named that way because it comes from the fact that it's next to the heart. And as for embryo, that comes from the full view of the nebula vaguely resembling one. Personally, I'll stick to calling it the soul nebula, especially because I'm only going to focus on its central part and not the entire embryo-shaped structure. The Sol Nebula itself lies about 6,500 light years away in Cassiopeia and stretches roughly two times the width of the full moon. The Sol Nebula itself, at least to my eye, it looks like it's made up of two larger bubble-like regions connected by diffuse gas and dust in between them, and then dark pillars stretch towards the center, which is the kind of detail that always looks fascinating in narrowband. So that's exactly where I'm pointing the telescope tonight, right in the middle where those two structures kind of meet. Since we're under a full moon, I want to go for high magnification and focus only on the brightest parts of the nebula. A smaller field of view means less sky gradient to deal with later and hopefully a cleaner, more detailed image. For that reason, I'm using my Celestron C11 HHD telescope tonight with the reducer attached. That gives me a good balance between a reach and the field of view with my IMX571 APS-C sensor that I mounted on here. The C11's long focal length is perfect for zooming in on the core of the Sol Nebula, those tiny structures that wider setups tend to not resolve. And yes, before anyone says anything, my telescope is not exactly spotless. The corrector plate is absolutely filthy. But honestly, I'm not too worried about it. A little bit of dust has virtually zero impact on the image quality. It only blocks a tiny fraction of the incoming light. I'd much rather leave it a bit dirty than risk scratching the coating while trying to clean it. So I'll only touch it once it is truly unbearable. 
Of course, that same logic doesn't apply to the filters, the reducer, or the camera sensor. Any dust or smudge on those will absolutely show up in the image, so those are always kept spotless as much as possible, and the remainder is removed via flats. So I am using the ASI 2600mm Pro with the IMX571 APS-C sensor paired with the Antlia 2.5 nanometer narrowband filters, H-alpha, O3, and S2. I'll also capture some RGB frames just for the stars. I'm a little concerned about the oxygen channel since oxygen tends to suffer most under the moonlight, but at this point it's worth a shot. So this could go one of two ways. Either I end up with a surprisingly decent image or confirm once again what every astrophotographer already knows that shooting deep sky during the full moon is a terrible idea. So the telescope is already set up. Once the sky gets dark, I'll polar line and start capturing the narrowband frames and see how far I can get. <laughs> and let's see if we actually get the promised five nights of clear skies. If everything goes as planned, this will be the start of a little experiment. How far can you push deep sky imaging under a bright full moon when you use the lit right filters and focus only on the most luminous regions of an emission nebula? Oh, and since a couple of you asked in previous videos and in private messages about this pier, which is, by the way, the same pier as I have um, on my city balcony. I literally just moved it because it is not fixed. This is just a custom-made pier. I found an ad online from a guy that he was doing custom piers. And I was in the situation where I am renting my apartment, so I have no way of actually building something fixed. Um, so therefore, I asked him if we could do something where I would have a base, which is just an 8 millimeter aluminum plate um, on which I have concrete blocks. So this is actually quite stable. Um, and this was actually the best thing I could have done because with a little bit of effort, I'm actually able to move this pier. And it is stable enough for me to have a semi-stationary place. I do have a number of little feet under the aluminum plate, which I was able to use to even out and make it horizontal. There's a helicopter. There's a helicopter like all the time. And then it's the most versatile thing ever because um, once I talked about this mounting system that is made by the Korean company Supermount that I have on my tripods, and then I put the exact same mounting system here. So if I want to go mobile or put this mount on my tripod, I can literally take it off, throw it on the tripod, tighten two screws, and I'm good to go. So it is truly super convenient. And if you're in a similar situation, I highly recommend doing this. was actually clear for more than five days. Um, it was like seven days and I think two of them were like partially cloudy. So I ended up with a lot of data. Let's have a look at what we have. So this is all the data that I've already pre-selected. These are just the good ones. So I have more than 13 hours of hydrogen. I have 21 hours of oxygen and I have 13 hours of sulfur for a grand total of 51 and a half hours, including a um, couple minutes of RGB. So admittedly, that's a lot of images. Um, it would have been a shame to not try anything. So first, um, let's just have a look at the photos. I'm just gonna quickly rename everything that was blue, red, green, and then we have oxygen. It's looking nice, look at the detail. Then we have sulfur, also pretty nice. And we have hydrogen. Wow, this is like noiseless. Okay, so first we're gonna do some deconvolution to sharpen our deep sky details. I'm gonna start by defining a little preview on the hydrogen. And I will open up Blur Exterminator and I will just do a little bit of trial and error to Try to get the amount of sharpening that sharpens all my details but doesn't like make it look all fake all right so this is sharp but it looks overly sharpened as you can see 
All right, so this point six of sharpening of the non-stellar looks good. This is actually what I'm gonna apply on probably all of them. So let's go ahead and do that quickly. I'm gonna combine them together. Um, I'm gonna use a Hubble palette, so that's an SHO palette. Using the channel combination, I will just fill in SHO and click the little circle and auto stretch. This is always like a magical moment. Well, it's a bit green, but if I actually do an unlinked stretch, I'm gonna remove the little chain and do an unlinked stretch. And this is like this magical moment when you see what you actually captured. And I'm gonna go ahead and remove those stars right away. I'm gonna select a no generation of star image and a large overlap. It does take longer, but I find that I get much better results um, for the remaining background in terms of evenness if I use that. Here we have our starless image. And actually, I'm gonna go ahead and crop it. And once I've selected a crop, I will drag the little triangle into a new icon so that I could actually apply it on all the other images. So I'm going to quickly go ahead and do that. And now it's time to go ahead and do the stretching, um, which we could do many ways. I've actually cut the video because I've been doing a little bit of back and forth. I was uh, doing um, the, my usual way, which is doing a classic old school color calibration and then doing a, a linked stretch on that. However, I think the results were not as good as the auto stretch that I'm seeing right here. So we're going to do something different. Um, this time I'm going to apply an unlinked stretch. I'll bring that into the histogram transformation sub window. All it does when you do uh, an unlinked his, um, auto stretch is it scales the channels separately. So all it does is an automatic white balance for you in the background. And we have our stretched result. Oh, I see these like pink little halos, which I assume are remaining over from stars that I had. So we will do a small like magenta cast removal. I'm going to do that by inverting the image by command I, and then we're going to do the SDNR for green, just a tiny amount. I don't expect that it will remove all of them, but at this stage, it should make it a little bit better. And in fact, it did if I invert it back. So it's time to actually stretch our image. So I'm gonna apply some curves. That's the curves transformation tool. And we start out with some basic S curve on the RGB channel. Wow, just by making it dark, it's actually so beautiful, I love it. Okay, so let's increase the contrast. Um, let's apply it. And we're gonna close the preview. Okay, I'm going to apply a second round of curves. That is looking beautiful, actually. It's like 90% done, I would say. We can close the curves transformation. And now um, we do see some parts, especially where it's darker, where it is a little bit noisy. So what I'm gonna do is I will just zoom into this part here that has this cloud of dust, I don't know which has a lot of noise, but also has details. So I feel like it's the, it's the right target to test my settings. Open up Noise Exterminator, and we will do a live view. And we see that these default settings, they do way too much. So what I'm gonna do is bring down the denoise to about 0.5. And I'm going to separate the intensity and the color. And that is because I actually don't want to remove too much of the intensity, but I want to remove that color noise. I know that some people might be wondering why I would deliberately leave some of that noise. I think having noise is a part of astrophotography and I would much rather have some of that than have my picture coming out as plasticky. It is just a preference. So it's time to get the stars. Now, um, I already saw at the start that my RGB data didn't come out very well at all. I don't know what happened there. We're just gonna work with what we have. Putting together the three channels gives us 
these. The stars are pink. Uh, not great, but we still have to color calibrate. So I'm just going to rename this RGB and I'm going to apply spectrophotometric color calibration that is after I've already late solved the image. So once we have that, we can do a length stretch. We have the right colors of the nebulosity itself, but the stars are really, really ugly still. So we're going to start with a little bit of blur exterminator magic. And there's a lot of back and forth uh, here trying to fix the image. So I almost never use the sharpen stars or halos setting, but here, the option is doing this or reshooting the stars on a different day. I usually don't care so much about gradients on my star images, but this one is so obvious and so visible that I'm just going to remove it. So since it is a very visible linear uh, gradient, I'm going to bring up automatic background extraction and I will just specify the function degree to be one. I will do subtraction and replace a target image. In fact, we've got this straight gradient and now we have our image without any gradients. At this point, we're ready to do some stretching. Once again, I'm just going to apply some auto stretch. Of course, this time it will be the length stretch because we have the correct color calibration on the images. So the stars should be the right color. Once we have our nonlinear star image, I'm going to use the star exterminator to actually get those stars off the image. Okay, so I will not be going through the whole process because it was very painful. The star image is of really bad quality. Um, so I considered going out again, but it has been now cloudy for a few days and I just wanted to finish the image. So that's it. I'm very happy with how the photo turned out. I'm also really happy with the composition I did. I think that just turned out exactly how I imagined it would. And yeah, I'm also satisfied with the filters, though I have a feeling that the 2.5 nanometer filters are not entirely parfocal with the LRGB from Antlia. I will do some more tests and if there's interest, I will update you guys. As for the moon, I probably wouldn't go out and put the telescope out for a single night of imaging under the full moon. However, if there's a scenario that it's going to be clear for a full week, I mean, I'm not going to waste that. Of course, if I had done the same amount of imaging under the new moon, the results would have been better. But I do hope that I managed to inspire some of you to go out um, under the stars over the upcoming full moon. If you've enjoyed this video and you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, uh, support my work by just clicking the subscribe button and leave a comment below. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, I wish you clear skies.